So we're going to talk about effusion and diffusion, and then a little bit about real gases, so how the ideal gas law deviates. All right, so first let's talk about effusion. This describes the passage of a gas through a tiny orifice or opening into an evacuated chamber or into a vacuum. Uh, and so we measure the speed at which the gas gets transferred into the chamber, and so that relates to the particle collisions and things like that. So the relative rates of effusion of two gases, and they need to be at the same temperature and pressure, are given by the inverse ratio, so inverse, we're flipping it, of square roots of the masses of the gas particles. And this is called Graham's Law of Effusion, where our capital M in this case stands for molar mass. So we have the, where's my pen, there it is. So we have the rate of effusion of gas one. You can determine what one you want to be gas one, divided by the rate of effusion of gas two. And so the difference, or the relative, the difference of these rates, or the division of these rates, is equal to the square root of the molar mass of gas two divided by the square root of the molar mass of gas one. Because remember, it's an inverse, so we're flipping them. Okay, so here's a picture of effusion just to give you an idea. We've got this chamber with some gas in it. We've got a small pinhole and it's going into a vacuum. And we're going to measure the rate at which the gas passes through the opening. So let's look at an example. So we want to calculate the ratio of the effusion rates of hydrogen gas and uranium hexafluoride. So I'm going to call gas 1 hydrogen gas. Remember, as a gas, hydrogen is H2. And I'm going to call gas 2 uranium hexafluoride. Well, uranium Hexa is 6, and so it's UF6. Well, I know that in order to find the rate of effusion of gas 1 divided by the rate of effusion of gas 2, because that's my ratio, this is what I'm solving for, that's equal to the square root of the molar mass of gas 2 divided by the square root of the molar mass of gas 1. So I need molar masses for each of these. So let's do H2. I know that the atomic mass is 1.008 times 2, gives me 2.016, I don't know why there's an extra one, there we go, and for UF6, uh, let's see, uranium is 238 plus 6 times 19, and that's going to give us a total of 352. So now I can just plug those in, because I'm looking for this entire quantity, and so if I do the math, I've already done it for you, I get 13.2. There are no units. What this means is that the rate of effusion of hydrogen is about 13 times the rate of effusion of uranium hexafluoride. Makes sense. It's a lighter particle, so it's going to pass through a lot more quickly. Okay, let's relate this to the kinetic molecular theory. We know the effusion rate depends directly on the average velocity of the particles. And so the faster the particles are moving, the more likely they are to pass through the opening. And so this equation is identical to Graham's law. And so kinetic molecular theory does fit the experimental results for effusion. Because remember, a theory wants to predict behavior and explain what. Okay, let's talk about the other part, which is diffusion. So this describes the mixing of gases. Uh, it can be slow because there are several other gas particles that it can come in contact with, such as oxygen, nitrogen from the air, etc. And it's hard to describe theoretically. So to fit kinetic molecular theory to this is sometimes difficult. Okay, so here we've got a concentrated area of particles, and it's basically spreading out. If you take a look at this picture, we've got two reactants, um, a liquid in a cotton ball, and then as it turns to a gas, they're going to mix. And you can see that where they mix is here. It's not exactly in between. So we can look at the rates of diffusion as being different. It looks like NH3 diffuses a little bit faster than HCl because where they're mixing is closer to the cotton ball with the HCl. In. Okay, so we've talked a lot about ideal gases and kinetic, kinetic molecular theory and relating all those things together. But, you know, we live in a real world. Not all gases behave as ideal gases, so let's look at the difference between real gases and ideal gases. So no gas exactly follows ideal gas behavior. Some are very close under certain conditions, okay, and so that's important. For an ideal gas, PV equals NRT, which equals 1. And so for real gases, PV equals NRT only approaches 1 at very low pressures. So remember we talked about those um, certain conditions? For a real gas to behave like an ideal gas, we need a low pressure. If we plotted PV equals NRT versus P, 
Ideal gas behavior would only be seen at high temperatures. So here's our other condition. We need high temperatures and low pressures for a real gas to behave like an ideal gas. So I put this in red. This means it's important. Real gases exhibit ideal gas behavior at low pressure and high temperature. That you are going to see again, so it's important to remember. Okay, so let's fit kinetic molecular theory to real gases. All right, where we said the volume didn't matter with ideal gases, it matters for real gases. And so we have to correct for that. And so here's our volume minus this quantity NB. Well, NB is what's called our correction factor. It's how we're correcting for that finite volume to get it closer to ideal. Well, N is the number of moles. B is considered what's called an empirical constant. And basically, you fit your equation to experimental results and come up with a constant. Now, you can look up um, the B value in a table. In fact, you can, um, if you're considering chemical engineering, this will be what's called your Bible. Um, so this is Perry's Chemical Engineering Handbook. And inside are all kinds of equations, um, graphs, um, pictures of different you know, equipment, but also a lot of variables or constants that you can look up given different conditions. Okay, so um, your textbook also has one, but um, you could always use this. And so you can find B for different conditions. Uh, we also need to allow for attractions between particles. And so remember we said with ideal that there weren't attractions between particles, but for real gases that does it does factor in. And so we need to make the observed pressure, the P observed, this would make the observed pressure smaller than it would be if the gas particles didn't interact. And so our real pressure appears smaller than ideal. And that's because the attraction between particles makes the gas particles hit the wall slightly less. And so you're going to get less of a pressure than you would if it was behaving as an ideal gas. Okay, so the higher the concentration, the more likely the gas particles will come close enough to attract. And so we know concentration is equal to moles per liter, so N over V in this case. And so we need to correct for that pressure difference, that lower pressure. And so we use A, which is our proportionality constant, just like B. You can look it up in a textbook. Um, and so we have A times our concentration squared. So this gives us a final equation with all of our corrections for volume and pressure of the observed pressures equal to nRT over V minus NB minus A times N over V squared. And so basically this, if we rearrange it, this gives us what's called the Van der Waals equation. Okay, so there it is. I won't read it for you. So we've got different parts that are correcting for certain variables. And so we've got that entire first part is correcting for the pressure to give us the ideal pressure. And then the second part is correcting for the volume to give us an ideal volume. And so A and B values are given for different gases, and they're based on experimental values. And like I said, they're in any textbook, and you can just look them up. OK, so let's take a look. So for several gases. H2N2, methane, and carbon dioxide, we can plot PV over NRT versus pressure. So for hydrogen, the plot will never drop below the ideal value of 1. So take a look at the drawing down here, or the graph. Here's our PV over RT over our pressure. So here's our ideal gas at a value. Remember, PV equals NRT was equal to 1. And so you can see that the hydrogen never goes below that one value, whereas our other gases, they dip down and then come back up. This means that hydrogen has low attractive forces. So that means that the value for H2 is also low. And this reflects how much correction had to be made to adjust uh, the observed pressure to the ideal pressure. So a low A value means there are weak intermolecular forces between the atoms in the compound.